Okay, so the new trailer for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse has just dropped and in this video we're going to be breaking down the new characters, easter eggs, hidden details and also giving our reaction to the new look. We also know a lot more about the movie than we did when we first covered it back in December last year and in this video we're going to be talking about it all. Now into the Spider-Verse ended with Miles on his bed looking up and at this point Gwen opened a portal above him. The first look had him slightly older and they've actually added in some extra clothes here to show that it isn't exactly the same moment that we last ended on. Therefore Gwen might have visited him from time to time or they could just be retconning the whole thing and being like forget about that ending. Now the first movie had the multiversal travel affecting those that moved across it and because of this they started to glitch out. However the post credit scenes show that Spider-Man 2099 had developed a device that allowed one to stabilise when in another universe. Known as Miguel O'Hara, I think he's going to be the driving force of the film that pulls all the characters together from across the Spider-Verse. Eh? Now if you look closely at Gwen's wrist, you can see that she's wearing something on it which will likely stop her glitching out and this is something we see in the other Spider-Men throughout the teaser. In the first look, we learned that Miles had been grounded but as Spider-Man hadn't, he was allowed to go out his room. Now this was coupled with him travelling across the multiverse into alternate realities. The first one we had confirmed was Spider-Man India who appeared in the Spider-Verse storyline in the comics that this movie is potentially based on. Now that should be a fully up to speed and if you enjoy the video please hit the thumbs up button and don't forget to subscribe for breakdowns like this every day. With that intro out of the way, huge thank you for clicking this, now let's get into the Across the Spider-Verse trailer. Now we start off with the Sony logo before transitioning into the Columbia one. If you slow the trailer down to 0.25 speed then you can see this change to an animation style similar to the old Archie comics. From here we join Miles' mother talking to him on a rooftop as he looks over the city similar to shots from Into the Spider-Verse. She talks about how she feels she lost her son and that he's not the child she knew. Now this is very important and it's something that often shows up as a character trait in every single Spider-Man. In order to protect the ones they love, Spider-Man has to stay distant and thus he seems like he's not really a part of their lives anymore. This was seen at the end of the first Raimi movie when Peter turned MJ down and it's a sacrifice that all the characters have to go through. Now at this point we get several shots of the last film. This includes Miles buying the costume from Stan Lee, him trying it on, him swinging with Peter B. Parker after robbing the computer from the Alchemex labs, riding with Gwen on the bus with Peter B. Parker in the back and him feeling like he doesn't measure up to being Spider-Man in the spider cave. However, this is shut down by the leap of faith moment that defined his life. This was when he became Spider-Man and we then see him leaping through the streets in never before seen footage. He shoots out several webs and this stops a taxi hitting pedestrians which is similar to how Andrew Garfield's version stopped that car in the Electro Times Square fight. We then see him snatching a hot dog and if you slow down the footage, you can actually see the sound effect of this saying take. He webs some money to the guy's chest and then we cut to his dad saying that he loves him. Now at this point we see a slight change up in Miles' room with more things being added. He's also now wearing a basketball jersey with the number 42 on it. 42 was a number that constantly appeared in the first movie at several points and this brings a lot with it. Not only is this the meaning of everything but it's also the number that Jackie Robinson wore. Jackie was the first black athlete to play Major League Baseball and the first movie had his number throughout as a nod to him. By his head we can also catch the cover of Amazing Fantasy 15 which was the first appearance of your boy Spider-Man. Gwen calls out to him and she's now wearing a pink jacket whereas in the first look she wasn't because I've watched it about 500 times. A Spider-Gwen coming back brings a lot more with it this time around. We know we'll be travelling to her world and also meeting her father Captain Stacy who'll be voiced by Shea Wiggum. Captain Stacy of course died in the 616 but we saw how the first Spider-Verse film changed things up. From the breadcrumbs of backstory we got from Gwen, it was her Peter that passed away and on his body we could catch lizard scales meaning that he became the villain instead of Kirk Connors. So her father being alive makes sense too and I'm interested to see what dynamic he brings to the movie. Now hexagonal portals are something that have popped up throughout a lot of MCU projects with them also showing up here. In the MCU they use his jump points in space and hexagons in general also showed up a lot in one division. There they signified Wanda's hex reality and for this movie they're also going to be used as travel points between realities. We did see characters travelling across the multiverse in the first film but it was absent of these hexagonal shapes. Therefore I think that this movie will have the hexagons sort of being like train tracks and that they take you from one predetermined destination rather than just flinging you out anywhere. That's also how they work in space with them directing people 
instead of just throwing them into a black hole. Sort of shows how it's all connected, but I might be reading into that too much, as hexagons in general are just interesting shapes that all stack together nicely. But this is a deep dive, and it's a good de it's an well, it's an all right deep dive, but you're still a f***ing chump. Now, across the Spider-Verse, there's lots of different characters jumping into alternate realities across the Spider-Verse. You might have guessed it. The internet's actually quite similar, and did you know that in different countries there actually exist different rules around what you can view and see? For example, a lot of my US heads don't know, but in England on Disney+, Plus, we have a whole section called Star that has lots of different programs that you can't get in the US. However, there is a way, and that comes with NordVPN. I really love NordVPN, I was so happy when they hit me up because I've been using them for over two years now, and they're an incredible VPN provider. Not even lying, every time I go on my laptop or on my TV or my Fire Stick, I'll end up using them because they provide so much access to so much stuff that I wouldn't get otherwise. They're very easy to use and you can connect with one click or enable auto connect for zero click protection. They've got over 5200 servers in 59 countries that all come with amazing speed. It's actually being confirmed by the speed tests and NordVPN is the fastest VPN out there. It's available on every major platform such as Windows, Android, iOS, Mac OS and even Linux. Now if you're getting a VPN, obviously security is probably on your mind as well and Nord have that covered. They've got advanced anti-malware features that are the next step in protecting the user and offering a safer and smoother online experience. The threat protection also stops web trackers and intrusive ads. When you download a file, the threat protection automatically scans it so you don't have to worry about malware. With these advanced tools as well, NordVPN is more than just a VPN, it's now a cyber security tool. So with the security handle, you can just sit back and relax and watch your favorite movies and TV shows without worrying if you're getting spied on. Get four months free on a two-year plan at nordvpn.com slash heavy spoilers. It's risk-free and NordVPN have a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you're in safe hands. I use it, all my team use it, we absolutely love it, so make sure you check it out. Thanks. Now at this point they end up in what appears to be the nexus where all Spider-Men will be gathered. There's a lot going on here, and, and when I saw it, mate, I was like, it's going to be a long night tonight. However, we want to point out all the spider people here, so sit tight and shut the fuck up. Now, the people standing behind the pair, uh, I'll probably end up covering as we pull out, but they're all pretty generic except for the PS4 looking one who I'll talk more about in just a bit. This isn't the PS4 Spider-Man, just a similar suit, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about the main one in just a bit. Now, when we go back, we can see two spider women on the left with one wearing the normal suit and another wearing what's either the negative one or the armor one. Next is the bulletproof suit, which you'll likely know from the PS4 game. Alongside this is a bigger Spider-Man, wearing a similar costume to the armor suit, and to the right of him is the Don PS4 Spider-Man. You might remember that his suit was actually shown in the Spider-Cave collection back in the first film, but this movie will see someone actually wearing it. I'm really hoping that this connects in with the next game, and with the Miles Morales one having a Spider-Verse suit in that, it looks like they could be tying it all together. The new game is coming up very soon too, and there are rumours that we might be getting a trailer very shortly that builds off the back of this. Anyway, if you're one of the 15 people that didn't play that game and want a quick rundown, it basically picked up with Peter Parker in the midst of his career as he rolled off the back of having just taken down the Kingpin. His Aunt May was also running Feast, alongside her partner Martin Lee. Turns out Lee was actually a villain that had risen up in the power vacuum left behind by Fisk, and under the name Mr. Negative, he did whatever he could to destroy Mayor Norman Osborn's re-election campaign. After attacking an event, Jefferson Davis was killed, and Peter became somewhat of a mentor to Miles. Miles eventually was bitten by a genetically engineered spider that was created by Osborn, which gave him his own spider abilities. Now, Peter was also working with Dr. Otto Octavius to create a new form of prosthetic limb. This ended up taking over his body, and thus he became Dr. Octopus. Spoiler alert. <laughs> now Peter managed to take both forces down, but unfortunately Aunt May was killed during this. There's tons of other stuff like villains escaping from the raft and so on, but I'll be here all day if I go through that, and, and those are the main points that you need to know about Spider-Man PS4, which isn't really his name. Either way, seeing him in the film is going to be a major addition, and it looks like he sort of gained his own kid, his own Miles, if you will, which is a reflection of Peter B. Parker and Miles' relationship. The person's wearing a black and red costume, and it looks very similar to the superior Spider-Man one. This is when Doc Ock mind-swapped with Peter, and he became the webhead. Slowly he was turned good by taking on the role, and it's so cool seeing them both here. Once we pull out, we get what I believe is the rubber suit used to fight Electro, and next to this is the Civil War suit. 
This was designed by Tony Stark for the Civil War comic and it's what he used when he sided with him. He ended up giving it up once he switched sides and it's such a cool suit that I'm glad to see here. Now as we pull further out to the left, we can see Spider Pig, hey, having that? Now, now this is Spider Cop who comes from the comics. If you've played the PS4 Spider-Man game though, you'll know that when he's chatting to Yuri that the wall crawler refers to himself as Spider Cop, but the real character will be popping up in this film. He's a seasoned vet of the NYPD that was given spider powers, and in the comics he was actually recruited by Spider-Gwen to help in the Spider-Verse storyline. Now to the right of him, we can also see what's a sort of steampunk Spider-Man, though I'm not exactly sure who this is. A lot of people in this shot are just kind of variations that aren't really from the comics, and if they are, then yeah, you know to drop it below. I don't know every single version of Spider-Man ever, so you probably picked the wrong video to watch. Now as we go further out, we do start to see more and more recognisable ones. The one with the bag on the head is a nod to when Spidey joined the Fantastic Four and had to don this in order to hide his identity. Love the art style of this and they have him in a 60s pop art animation to reference the era he debuted in. In the top right we also have Spider Werewolf, which hey, no prize is for guessing which version of Spider-Man that is. Now Scarlet Spider will be featuring in the film too. This often overlooked character has kind of been ostracised, but he originates from the clone saga that dominated comics in the 90s. During that time, publishers were replacing their main heroes with other versions, and just in the same way that Batman was replaced by Jean-Paul Valley, Peter Parker was pushed out too. Created by the Jackal using Peter's DNA, it was thought that the clone died alongside his creator back in the 70s. However, it turned out that he survived, and realising that he was a clone, he decided to live in exile away from New York. Using his uncle's first name and Aunt May's maiden name, he was inspired to become his own person that was sort of like a drifter moving from town to town and helping out people. His spider sense aided several police investigations, and he fell in love with a woman called Janine who too was on the run. Being racked with guilt though, she ended her own life, and Ben became a janitor at Portland High School. He saved a woman from some home invaders and was once more inspired to use his great powers to take on great responsibilities. Eventually he went back to New York and confronted Peter and helped him get through some really bad times. He worked alongside Spider-Man as the Scarlet Spider and eventually he became the main one after it seemed clear that Peter was the clone and not Ben. Drove Peter almost insane and though they kept their names, he ended up leaving the position. Of course, this was eventually all revealed to be untrue and Peter Parker took the role back as the main one, but there was a time where Ben was your number one. Now from here we cut back to Gwen and Miles and see Peter B. Parker, the boy, the Don Dotter, never late with the Rent King, who is back for the movie. Obviously, he was one of the big parts that made the first movie as successful as it was, and there was never any doubt that he was going to be back for a sequel. When we last left him, he was going to his MJ to fix their relationship, and it looks like it's good news. Being a dad myself, I instantly recognised that carrier on the front, it looks like my man is now a father. Congratulations, now hit the thumbs up button. Now at this point we get the shot of Miles and Gwen sitting upside down on a ledge. This has been used in a lot of the promotional material and it's of course riffing on the shot from the first movie in which Miles sat by himself. Interestingly, Miles' spider symbol is the right way up here, meaning that he must be wearing it upside down. Strange, but also Gwen's hair is longer here too, with her having it in a ponytail showing roughly how much time has passed since the first film. Now from here we see a motorbike busting through the air, and I believe this is Issa Rae's version of Spider-Woman. It's a big departure from her look in the comics, but with this being the multiverse, they've clearly changed her up. This is a major character in the Spider-Man lore, and she was introduced all the way back in 1978. Funny, funny story, if you want to know, Stanley, he actually thought that some other comic book company would probably just do a gender swab of their number one webhead if they ever got hold of the copyright to him, so he just came up with Spider-Woman in order to stop this from happening. She was only supposed to feature in a Marvel spotlight, however, she's done a lot since her creation and has become a mainstay in the comics. Marvel Spotlight 32 sold really well, and the company saw her as being more than someone used to establish a trademark. Marv Wolfman was given an ongoing series, and this allowed him to take the character and push her to the forefront. Now, originally, she was a spider that transformed into a human. Not sh**. However, this was quickly retconned, and she was said to be a human that just had memories of being a spider planted into her by Hydra. Given the name Jessica Drew, this was a combination of Marv's daughter's first name and the name of her favourite detective, Nancy Drew. Now Jessica can fly, climb walls, and basically do a lot of what a spider can. 
If you've played the Miles Morales Spider-Man game, then you'll also be familiar with his Venom Energy Blasts, which Jessica herself can do. She also has pheromones, which she can use to manipulate emotions. Now, her origin stories had several retcons to her, but the current one that's seen as the canon is that her mother was struck with a beam of radiation when she was pregnant with Jess. This contains several different spider DNAs, and you, you bloody guessed it, Jessica was born with spider powers. That's more the current understanding of her, though, like I said, depending on what you read, you might get something different. Like a lot of comic book characters back then, she had a slow decline over the years, and the writers actually killed her off in her 50th issue. She kind of faded into obscurity, but she was brought back in a big bad way during the 2005 New Avengers run. She also played a big part in Secret Invasion when a scroll masqueraded as her, though we know she won't be popping up in the Disney Plus adaptation. Still though, great seeing her in this, and it's one of my favourite appearances in the trailer. Now you might also notice who she's attacking, and this is actually the Vulture. Whereas in the classic incarnation he was Adrian Toomes, they are changing things a lot up for the movie. Now Toomes in the comics is mostly shown as an old guy, he uses a Vulture costume to commit robberies. For the movie though, he will be voiced by Joe Matacon, and will be a renaissance inspired criminal that has an Italian accent. Yo Matacone. Probably a bit offensive that to some people. Now, when you get when you get an Italian actors, yeah, you should have just got Chris Pratt to voice that if you wanted Italian. But I'm guessing this guy, he's going to be pretty good as well. Big change up for the Vulture. Obviously, we saw him done classically by Michael Keaton, and it is going to be interesting to see what he brings to the movie. Now, Charles Murphy posted some of the first story details for the movie yesterday on his website, Murphy's Multiverse. We'll talk about what he said on the spot later on, but we have a pretty good idea of what the film will be about based off this new teaser in his report. It says, After reuniting with Gwen Stacy, Brooklyn's full-time friendly neighbourhood Spider-Man is catapulted across the multiverse, where he encounters a team of Spider-People charged with protecting its very existence. But when the heroes clash on how to handle a new threat, Miles finds himself pitted against the other Spiders, and must redefine what it means to be a hero so he can save the people he loves most. Now who this new threat is, is likely the spot, however there are other big villains that could be popping up later on. Now he's going to be clashing heads with Miguel O'Hara, aka Spider-Man 2099. O'Hara is half Irish and half Mexican, and he is a Spider-Man of the futuristic Nueva York. The majority of the city, I hope I pronounced that right, and the majority of the city is controlled by the Alchemex Corporation, which was also the science division that Kingpin ran in the first Spider-Verse film. As a young adult, O'Hara got a job working for them, which is where he was pressured into running a test to imprint genetic codes onto humans. The test subject died, and racked with guilt, Miguel ended up going to his boss Tyler Stone, who gave him a drink. This was laced with a futuristic drug called Rapture that bonded itself to someone's blood and gave them intense hallucinations. In order to rid himself of this, Miguel ran the test on himself, which is when his DNA was spliced with that of a spider's. He gained several abilities including the usual spider powers, such, such as increased strength, speed and also reflexes. However, Miguel can also move so fast that he actually leaves behind a decoy. In addition to this, he can communicate with people telepathically, and he carries elongated fans that can secrete a paralyzing toxin. He has razor sharp claws too, which we see pop out, and he looks way bulkier than the design that we've seen on him previously. When we catch him, he's looking over a video of his daughter, and the name Ryella can be seen up top. Clearly a nod to Riley, which, as we mentioned, was Aunt May's maiden name. Now, though I don't think he's in the trailer, we know that Spider-Punk will be in the film, and that he'll be voiced by Daniel Kaluuya. The character was originally riffing on Spider UK, but he's kind of grown into his own entity and thing. Coming from Earth 138, he was revealed to be Herbert Brown, who was a homeless teenager that was transformed due to Norman Osborn dumping some toxic waste. He's a punk rocker that carries his guitar with him almost wherever he goes, and in the comics it's what he used to smash Norman Osborn's head in like it was that like button. In the Spider-Verse storyline, he was recruited by Superior Spider-Man to join the Spider-Men, and I can't wait to see what he's like in the film, especially with the art style they could do with him. Lots of crazy punk stuff they can do with this punk, you goddamn chump. See you, chump. Now there's a massive scene where lots of different characters jump miles, and if you look closely, you can see one with six arms that wraps themselves around him. This is similar to the mutated Spider-Man from the comics and TV show, and they, of course, spiders in general have six arms and two legs, equaling eight limbs. You see that? Now, I just love this shot of them all swinging towards him, and we even see a slightly chubby one gliding in. Now, Japanese Spider-Man is also going to be featuring in the film as well. 
He pulls from the live-action TV show Universe, created in 1978, and though often overlooked, this live-action adaptation massively helped to push the character's popularity worldwide. His origin story is really removed from the typical Spider-Man stuff, and originally he was a motorcycle racer called Takuya. A UFO called the Marveler fell to Earth, and after journeying inside of it, he was injected with blood from Planet Spider, which gave him his abilities. As always, aliens and clicking together his bracelets activates his costume. He can also shoot web lines from them and seeing him pop up, yeah, it's a nice thing for the fans who, who've watched a couple of episodes of that show. If you've sat through the whole thing, congratulations because you're better than me. Yeah, and I'm sure you're going to love this just as much as I am. Now 2099 rushes towards him and in slow-mo you can see him enlargening his gauntlets as he charges towards him. Such a cool shot, but he's clearly barking up the wrong tree. We actually know that the villain in the movie is going to be the spot and that he'll also be the bad guy in the sequel Beyond the Spider-Verse. Ken Powers is directing the film and over the last couple of weeks he's had a number of big interviews with some big outlets. When discussing the movie with Total Film, he confirmed that the character will be a villain across both films. Whereas the first movie dealt with the Kingpin, this more multiversal one will be bringing him into it to add to the idea that the further out you get, the more far out the villains do as well. It's going to be such a cool addition for the movie, and in the comics, Jonathan Owen was a highly decorated graduate of MIT that was even roommates with Quentin Beck. A divorced dad, he started working for the Kingpin, and he was tasked with discovering how the cloak's powers worked. The cloak can create portals in himself, and Kingpin wanted to duplicate this power for his own personal gains. Now, due to his origin story, he may be linked in with the first film, and there's the potential that he helped Kingpin build his collider back in that movie. Either way, Jonathan succeeded in his research, and after creating a portal one night, he stepped into it, which is where he was taken to the cloak's dark dimension. It's not to be confused with the other dark dimension, and here he, he began to master the realm, and looked about at all the other portals for the place where he'd just come from. After swimming through the landscape for some time, he was able to return home, and make it back to the kitchen where he'd opened up the dimension. Now, upon returning to the 616, his body had undergone a major transformation and he was littered with the portals that we see on him now. When he was in the Dark Dimension, the other portals had attached themselves to his skin like leeches and they basically made him a walking wormhole. He's going to be littering the landscape with black holes, which are slowly going to start sucking things into them. Now, in the comics, he's pretty much a joke character that's not really a big bad, which is why I was really surprised that he was chosen for being such a major threat. However, after thinking about it, there's so many really cool things that they can do with him, especially from an animation point of view. Watching him get hit in a portal and their fist popping up somewhere else is such a cool thing that they can do, and the battles will become next level by having him in the movie. I love this shot where we see Miles kicking the spot in the chest, and then it hits Gwen who's stationed behind them. If you look at his hands, you can also see that he's throwing spots out too. If you've ever watched the 4K into the Spider-Verse on an OLED, then you'll know there's bits where the full screen goes completely black, and then it has these little bursts of colour. I'd love to see something like that with the Dark Dimension too, and having characters pop in and out of it will, will be absolutely incredible. Just shows how the villain can use the heroes to fight each other. I'm getting hyped up to watch some insane fights playing out. Anyway, we end with everyone on Miles, and a what a banger of a teaser. There's so many different animation styles that are going to feature in this film, and whereas the first movie just had the one, this will have six different styles across the entire thing. The creative team have said this is to wow the audience every time we enter a new universe. And the style will also help reflect the world and characters, and it's going to add so much more to the movie. For example, Gwen's home will be more impressionistic like a watercolour painting, and it'll bring a new dimension to the movies and the animation style overall. Into the Spider-Verse of course won an Oscar, and by the looks of this new teaser, I can easily see this securing one too. Looks like they've knocked it out of the park, and they're going to be having so many different Spider-Men in it, that it's going to make the first one look like they were just having a quiet gathering around your mates on a Monday night. Lord and Miller said there's going to be 240 characters in the movie, and this is going to be a crazy celebration of every version we've had so far. The new look feels like it's barely scratching the surface, but it's packed with so much that I can't wait to see what the final release is like. Great trailer, and obviously, uh, let me know your thoughts on it below. We are in a competition right now and giving away three copies of House of the Dragon Season 1 on the 15th of December, and all you have to do to be one of the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the trailer. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. 
If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of the boys' spin-off show, Gen V, which is on screen right now. Lots of cool easter eggs and links back to the main series, so definitely head over there right after this. By the way, thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.